every every team is is has its own culture. That's why I actually tend to say because I work with cultures in like the country sense but that I also work with with corporate teams like culture in a sense is group behavior uh, so basically I say that that cultural fluency is really the superpower of of understanding others and and mm. our differences um it's it's my term for cultural intelligence or you know cultural agility uh, I tend to recommend not mm-hmm. to make assumptions immediately um because mm-hmm. our brains are just wired that way like you know we we have our own experiences and then our brain just learns to interpret everything through that. I think a lot of the conflicts we are seeing are really at the bottom are, are stemming from the lack of awareness and, and really all this polarity, which is just also the lack of understanding or, or even just realizing that, that there are more sides to one truth. Hello and welcome to MET. I'm pleased that you've chosen to join us for another interesting conversation today, or at least I believe it's going to be interesting. This time we're going to be exploring our fascinating world that we live in and discussing some of the challenges we experience through intercultural relationships. And we'll probably delve into what our guest likes to call cultural fluency. Um, I'm quietly confident that we're probably going to go down the path of talking about cultural diversity, global team dynamics, perhaps even taking a sideways glance at some of the likely causes to our geopolitical tensions that we're experiencing on so many of the world fronts at the moment. And you heard me introduce our guest, but here to help us embark on this journey and unpack some of these challenges is our guest, Chenanga Frazikas. And I said that wrong. Let me say it again. Chenanga Frazikas. How is that? Yeah, it's, it's good. It's good. Chenanga Frazikas. <laughs> Close um, enough. <laughs> it's, my, it's my Australian accent. So, <laughs> so no, it's sitting, perfect. Thank you. You're sitting over in Madrid at the moment. Welcome, by the way, to the ET Project. But you're sitting over in Madrid at the moment, I believe. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I am sitting in Madrid, but I'm originally from Hungary. So this is why I have this slightly strange sounding name <laughs> or like right. unusual name. Right. Um, but yeah. Well, it, it, um, all the European names test me. So yours is no, <laughs> yours is no different if that makes you completely better. And I apologize for my terrible attempt. But oh, um, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. You're in Madrid. And as we record this, it'll be released later. But as we record this, last night, Spain won the UEFA European Championship against England. They defeated England 2-1. So I can only imagine what the atmosphere in Spain or in Madrid at the moment is like. How are you finding it? It's very very um hype i would say <laughs> i mean already already the game experience i'm not so much into football but even mm-hmm. so i i always follow what's happening because everybody else is following what's happening and spanish yes. are very expressive in their support and they are very vocal so even, even right. if i'm at home i can always hear the shouting and you know mm-hmm. the goal and you know these things and yeah yesterday night i was like i was sure in the moment when it happened that Spain won because it's just all of a sudden got very noisy and very loud and very happy around me. <laughs> well, congratulations to all my Spain friends and colleagues over there. I'm sure they're celebrating hard. What what I found interesting was that the tournament is a, a wonderful backdrop for our conversation today on intercultural relationships. It it, it brings together such a diverse uh, European mix of countries. And of course, every country has the nuances. They all have their own cultural um, way of dealing with things. From a professional perspective, I'm sure there was many observations from you or your from your side on as you watched or listened to commentators, the media, even the teams themselves. Was, it, was there anything that stood out from an intercultural perspective as, as the tournament rolled on? I think something that always fascinates me when I watch games is to see the difference in the nonverbal communication. Like, um, you know, they, we always see like these close-ups of the coaches, like looking at their teams and 
how they communicate what the teams are on on the field and and I find that fascinating to watch because I, I find mm. that you know in some cultures it's all very about the gestures and then like you can see that they are just really like waving and you know make all these wild hand moves and they are like their faces look very expressive whereas for other cultures like the coaches are very very like well not necessarily calm person but it's it's much less expressive mm. and like they have much less facial expressions or they just like and kind of like yeah lead the team differently or give the instructions differently and and I always find the difference quite striking yeah yeah I, it's very true I I'm really interested watching intentional or maybe unintentional uh, mind games that a lot of the coaches and the and the even the media gets on board with the coaches and they play all these games in the media it's quite quite fascinating before we get too deep into our topic, I, I think you have a um, a very rich history and, and backstory, and I wonder if you'd mind sharing a little bit about you know your journey early in life. But there was something I read; it was called third culture child, and yeah. I'm fascinated to know what that means. So, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about your background and, and what that actually has has a role in this discussion sure <laughs> so um i work as an intercultural trainer and team development expert at the moment and it wasn't really a linear journey to get into the field mm -hmm. um but yes i did grow up as a third culture kid which is which basically means that i wasn't born in the same country where i grew up in and and in my case, it even took me a very long time to realize that this made a difference because um, mm. so my family is originally from Transylvania, which okay. used to belong to Hungary before the first world war or like, yeah, before the Trianon agreement. And mm -hmm. so it's it used to be a part of Hungary. It's the same language. So when we moved to Hungary when I was four, the shift didn't seem as big because the language was the same. Right. But somehow I always felt because, of course, I went to school in Hungary and then, yeah, like I was a part of the system there I guess um, yeah. but I always somehow noticed that I was somehow a little different like even though it's the same language and, and all that like there were still certain words that we used in the family that others didn't or there were some foods or there were just some dynamics in my family that mm. I didn't really see anywhere else and and it really just shaped the way I see the world I guess and then yeah once I got into the field of intercultural training I realized that okay this is this is really something that actually shapes someone's journey um but i did it wasn't really a conscious thing un until i started working as an intercultural trainer and then of course when i was at university i lived abroad i lived in belgium for for a brief year and then i got right. back home and i traveled a lot and i moved to spain 10 years ago so i'm I'm still on this intercultural journey <laughs> but but it's it's also it it was an interesting discovery even for me to understand that being a third culture kid actually shaped me more than i would imagine what what sort of impact did it have on your perspective around the whole cultural diversity and and how you see things, let's say throughout your career, do you think it had a, a big impact? I think it it had a bigger impact than I realized because mm. I didn't really feel that it had an impact for a while, but I just noticed that I, I saw things slightly differently. I think that was that actually was the impact that, that yeah. I just realized that, okay, I have different perspectives on things and it was, it just felt easier for me to shift between different perspectives because okay. of this. Right. And you speak a number of languages. I'm guessing in, in the work that you do and in the countries that you've moved around, this has been a huge uh, benefit for you. Yes, yes. So I speak four languages. Um, also, I always say because I'm Hungarian, Hungarian is not really a useful language outside of okay. Hungary because it's a small country, you know, so and right. it's, it's one of those magical languages that doesn't really sound like any other language. Okay. Um, but yes, but I did learn English, French and Spanish. And, and it, it really is an added value because I also and I also tend to, to really recommend this to, to those clients who, of mine who, who move abroad. To learn the mm. language because once mm. once you actually learn the language it also gives you a different access to a different layer of the culture and right. i think that's that's very enriching when yeah. it comes to intercultural experiences so I, i'm embarrassed to admit it but i've i've lived or been based at least in shanghai for almost 20 years 19 years and uh, i don't speak 
Mandarin. Um, my wife is Chinese, so you would think I would, but I don't. And I 100% agree with you. It's my biggest regret that I didn't put in the effort and the time to learn the language because it would have given me such a deeper understanding of, of the whole culture and, and, you know, the way society operates. So, yeah, I... Or I even even the interactions are slightly different. I, I noticed that a lot in Spain because, well, I don't look Spanish, obviously. So people sometimes look at me and they don't really know like what language to talk to me. And they, they sometimes start in English, like Spanish also very like modest about their English. They always say that they don't speak English well, which is not always true, but then they mm. are quite shy about this. And then they kind of start in English and then I respond in Spanish and they're like, oh, oh my God, you speak Spanish and your Spanish is so good. And it just totally changes the interaction and it, it just changes everything. So that's why How I tend it? to recommend do you, this. Do you have an accent? Yes, I do. I have an accent in every language I speak, I think, at this point. <laughs> yeah. But it also it makes a good conversation starter, I guess. Oh, for sure, for sure. But you're 100% correct. When people hear you, even if you can't speak the language very well, when you make the effort to speak in that um, country's language, people really endear to you. And uh, it changes the whole dynamic in the relationship. So, yeah, yeah very, yeah. Also, very also interesting. They've yeah they also really appreciate it like they, if they see that you make the effort they, they help yeah. you on and they really try to like make also more effort to understand you which i think also makes things a little easier yeah very true I, i'm wondering if we go back to earlier in your career um the experience within the corporate world how much did that feed in or shape your understanding around the cultural dynamics was it was it something that played a big part? Yes, I would say yes, because I, I always, even in my first job, I worked internationally. So I worked with different okay. cultures and that was, and we worked remotely with them. And that was before remote work was even a thing. Like we didn't have Zoom and, and Teams yeah. and all these, like we had phones and we had all these conference phones and yeah. So it wasn't even as visual as it is. And I remember because I didn't, have a cultural preparation for this like I had a lot of shocks especially at the beginning where I also didn't know my colleagues as well yeah um, from from the other countries and and sometimes the communication was just very very well not shocking but it was just it didn't really flow mm -hmm. and it took me a while to figure out why so I think these these experiences they all added up to the point where I realized that okay like this is this is something there's something about this field that I want to figure out more what what was the catalyst then for you to transition so out of the corporate environment into more you know run, freelancing or running your own business and and working by yourself was there a a catalyst that that really you can put your finger on well i started it as a side gig at first because okay. I, I, I had the idea that, oh, okay, I want to do intercultural training. And I first, I, of course, wanted also to know more about the field and just find out whether there is mm. something to it. And then I discovered that there's a whole field to it, which was also new <laughs> for me because it's, it's not new for my experience, but I didn't know that there was actually a service like that. So that took some time to figure out. And of course, I also wanted to educate myself and see what tools I could use and how I could go about this whole thing. So that took some time. Mm. And then I and then it I kept going with this as a side gig for a while. And I think the catalyst was more, I don't know, with like the dynamics around the pandemic and then after, you know, just to see oh. like all the things happening in the world. At some point, I just came to the conclusion that, OK, like there will never be a perfect moment. So I either mm. just pick a moment and go with it and see what happens or or I can keep try to drift with it. But then I will be stuck in this in between sort of place for a while. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just curious about, you studied intercultural relationships at university. International relations, yes. In, international relations, sorry. Um, how much does that play a part in your activities outside or in, in your career at the moment? Were, was it useful for building a base or, you know, what what's the relevance for that study and what you're doing? 
I have to say I got I got into international relations at first because while well, I was 18 when I had to choose it and I had no idea what I wanted to do and it sounded interesting it was a little bit of everything and then I basically yeah. just went with that and with the languages but now that I think of it it helps me more than than I realized because it also gives me um, a lot of historical background for example of the countries mm. and that that is something I always build into my work because a lot of the cultural differences we have also are based on historical events Yes. And they really impact generations and they really impact a lot of the behaviors that we see. Mm. So I think from that sense, it's definitely something very helpful. And I even remember I had a couple of um, communication classes or like this cultural differences classes that I always found very fascinating. Right. Yeah, it, it, it truly is um, quite diverse. And, and this was the reason for my question. Uh, I can imagine it played plays a big part even today. You you do a lot of work with, um, if I'm correct in, in my research, you do a lot of work with Eremus, Eremus, uh, the European... Uh, Erasmus, yeah. Yeah, Erasmus, okay. Yeah. Erasmus, yes. <laughs> so this is the European Commission um, and their program for education, training and health. Um, by reading some of what you've done, it, it's... I, I'm really fascinated by how you are able to build a program across such a diverse mix of countries. What, like, well, how do you start off with this? So I come out of a learning background as well, and I, uh, I, I was trying to put myself into your shoes, and I was thinking, gosh, where would I start? How do you kick that off? So basically, my story with Erasmus Plus was that I moved to Spain through an Erasmus Plus volunteering program. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so Erasmus Plus has different pillars and then one is aimed at universities. I think that's the most well-known in Europe, you know, with the student exchanges. But then I found out at some point that there was also a part of it that, that helped NGOs get like more help. And then it was also right. about like the exchange, but it's slightly more on the, like the practical side of things. Mm -hmm. And then I, I went to volunteer, so I came to volunteer uh, to Spain. And then my organization, we also, I helped them write different projects, organize youth exchanges. And I also even had some trainings as a participant when I came here, like to kind of welcome us to Spain and have like a little bit of preparation for what we can expect and, and these mm -hmm. kind of things. And then I discovered that it also has a training side to the program, right. which is, it is also primarily aimed at NGOs. So it's it's something that you know NGOs can can apply for different funding. They come up with different projects, and and so there's there's a whole world to that. And then I was lucky enough to to come across a now also very good friend of mine, but also fellow trainer who who is a member of an organization who's very active in Erasmus Plus. And then we just had this amazing connection, and we started doing trainings together. And then that's how I got into this whole world. And then we always, because it's all very practical, it's, it's all centered around non-formal education. So it's more about practical learning and, and building different competences and, and really trying things out and not just focus on the theory. Right. That always gives us a very nice um, open canvas to really build from different things and, and take different approaches. And then, of course, there's always a huge mix of culture, which are like, these are usually like five, six days training courses. And on the second or the third day, we always have like some clashes because that's when the team starts to come together and then all these differences come out and, you know, we need to wait for some people more to start a session and then the others get already anxious. And yeah, yeah so there's a whole part to this as well. What were some of the challenges you've come across? in doing what you do? Um, usually <laughs> the perception of time, which is very different across cultures, I think that tends yeah. to be quite a, <laughs> quite a challenge in most group settings, I would say. Um, but even the communication, so communication in the sense that, you know, some cultures are way more direct and outspoken and what you say mm -hmm. is what you mean. Whereas in other cultures, it's much more about like keeping the group harmony and keeping, you know, like, staying kind to everyone so it's not as direct and then it can be misunderstood. So I think these these are the two things that usually stand out quite a lot. Right, right. Uh, you, you've lived in different countries and I'm wondering how living and working in those different countries has contributed to your approach when you, th you talk and, and teach intercultural relationships. It helped me a lot, both from mm -hmm. the sense that like I can really 
empathize with the experience of my clients because I went through those challenges myself. Yeah. And and it also because I worked with so many different countries and then I also had flatmates from different countries and I had all kinds of life experiences right. with, with cultural diversity that also helps me come up with like more concrete examples and it helps me explain certain concepts easier, I think. Yeah, yeah, I can I can imagine that. Um, I think you made the comment somewhere that you came to the realization at some point that different just as different countries have unique cultures, so do organizations. Yeah. And um, I, I found that absolutely true in reflection myself, thinking about the different countries and the different cultures I've been engaged with in different organizations. And almost to the point where every, every organization is somewhat unique, it, it made me wonder if you bring together people from different organizations and different countries, how do you bridge you know, that divide? How do you start with that? Yeah, I, I agree with you. Every every team is is has its own culture. That's why I actually tend to say because I work with cultures in like the country sense, but then I also work with with corporate teams. Like culture in a sense is group behavior. Right. And it's basically a set of rules that the team sets out for, for itself. So this is why organizational culture in a way is also, yes, it's culture because they, they set the rules and they, they set their way of functioning. Mm. And yes, that, that is different across not just organizations, but even within the organizations, depending on different teams, there, there can be massive differences. And then, yeah, if you bring them together to like an all company yeah. thing, that, that could come with some challenges. But I usually like to approach this the, the same way as I usually do with, with any kind of cultural training, like just really become aware of the, of the differences and, and have open conversations about, mm -hmm. about this. Because, yeah, like the thing with communication is there's this quote that goes that, um, I don't remember how exactly it was, but it's about, you know, like there's this um, perception of, of communication that it took place when it didn't so oh, because right. yeah. people people just live in their own or like work in their own little uh, team and they just assume that okay the culture they experience there must be how it is everywhere because that's their experience mm. just openly talking about these differences can already be a good start to just understand that oh okay so we're not really dealing with the same perception we don't all understand the same things we don't all go through the same experiences so already opening that could be a good start I think Right, right. Well, you, you had a, um, a real life experience yourself moving to Spain, you said about 10 years ago. Is, is there anything that stood out during that transition yourself that you had to adjust to or, or accommodate that you didn't expect? There were, there were quite a few small things, I would say. Like overall, it didn't feel like a very different place. But then as I started living here, there, there were small things that just kept coming up. Like, for example, yeah. like I, I remember the first time I went out to a social gathering with Spanish people. And so where I come from, like if you go out with a social group, like you just sit down at a table, usually one person talks at a time you wait until they finish, you react. There's one topic of conversation and it's all very easy to follow. Whereas here in Spain, you go out with a group, it's normally more people talking at the same time. You, you, you either interrupt or you don't talk. There are several topics going on in parallel. So it's, it's, a, it's a very different experience. And I remember the first time I went out with Spaniards, I was in shock. Like I was just sitting there looking at people, trying to keep up with the conversation. I barely spoke because I was waiting for my turn, which never came. <laughs> and then I, I ended up with a headache at the end of the evening. And, and one of my friends who was sitting next to me, she just kept asking whether I was okay because she couldn't really interpret my silence. <laughs> So it was it was a very different experience, and this is just one of the many like small things that that I had to learn to adjust to. I, I have to ask you in Hungary, what time do you have your evening dinner? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good question. I would normally eat at like six thirty seven, mm. I guess. And yeah, here in Spain, it's like nine <laughs> was the earliest. <laughs> Well, I, I had dinner with one of my friends and, and um, they had to apologize to the restaurant owner 
because we were so early. And this was like <laughs> 8.30 in the evening. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking, in China, we we quite regularly sit down for dinner at 5.30 in the evening. So, oh, wow. yeah. Um, yeah, it's just one small example of cultural difference. You, you have this uh, term that you refer to, cultural fluency. I, yeah. I'm curious to understand what that means specifically. Uh, so basically, I say that, that cultural fluency is really the superpower of, of understanding others and, and mm. our differences. Um, it's, it's my term for cultural intelligence or, you know, cultural agility, or there, there are many terms for it, but I like to mm. call it cultural fluency because I, I, for me, this is closer to a concept of learning a language mm -hmm. that, you know, you start with certain concepts and words and then you add the grammar and then you keep building the layers and then some concepts are harder to digest than others and it's also because I think it's not a skill that is linear I think it's something that you just keep keep learning over and over again so it's not something that you just learn and then it's there like similar with the yeah. language like there's always days when you just feel that oh yeah I could do this you know and I can do whatever in this language and then the next day just your brain crashes and you just don't really know so yeah. I feel like it's it's similar to that. It's constant trial and error, constant experimenting, because also, of course, we have cultural differences, but those are mostly statistical averages. Of course, there are also the individual differences to it. Mm. So it's always mm. comes with exploration and also exploring our own preferences. So it's something that is very dynamic and it's very, yeah, it's not, mm. it's definitely not a linear process, I would say. <laughs> no, I, I fully agree. If, if we were to try and narrow down some of the, let's say, essential skills that, that we need as individuals to try and thrive in diverse cultural environments. So I'm sure you come across a lot of people that work in multicultural environments. Are there any essential skills? You've, you've mentioned communication a few times, and I, I'm guessing that's at the core. But is there anything you can include communication. Is is there anything that jumps out as an essential skill that people really should be aware of? Uh, I tend to recommend not to make assumptions immediately because um, mm -hmm. our brains are just wired that way. Like, you know, we, we have our own experiences and then our brain just learns to interpret everything through that. And then when we go to different places or go to new environments, it just jumps to conclusions for us, even, you know, without us like consciously doing that. Yes, so I would tend to mm -hmm. tend to recommend to to really ask questions. I think mm. it's like my top tip. Just really like if you, you know see something and then you're not sure or or you even just have the slightest doubt, it's just much better to to clarify or ask back again or confirm or or really just yeah, yeah make it verbal because because it's just easier to get on the same page faster than you know just making assumptions and then just go the wrong way altogether. <laughs> That, and that sounds such a simple skill set, but um, putting that into practice sometimes, particularly when when maybe you're not feeling so comfortable in the environment, that, that can often become quite challenging, I would imagine. In your experience, how difficult is it in a classroom setting for people to really pick up on these types of skill sets? I know you do a lot of experiential learning, which I'm sure helps a lot, but do you have a feeling for a classroom setting versus doing it out there in the, the real world? Well, I would say it's based on my own experience because I come from a school system where it's very theoretical and it's much about memorizing things and not so much about <laughs> using them in practice that I, I find that the schooling I had didn't really prepare me for these kind of experiences. Mm. But also I have to acknowledge that I'm also the kind of person that learns more from practice. So this is also something as a trainer, of course, I keep in mind when I design my courses that, yeah, people mm. learn differently. So I usually include a little bit of everything. So just to make sure that everybody can can pick up the way they want to learn. Yeah. But I do think this is definitely something that is a much more practical skill. And it, it really just requires more awareness and then just like having the courage to really put it into practice because it's mm -hmm. it's so different depending on each context and, and each team and each culture. Yeah. that it's it's hard to get like really a solid theoretical background for it mm. i i'm a very pragmatic person so that's part of the reason i i asked the question okay. because i i i have to be able to 
put my hand on it. It has to be, you know, something that I can really simplify in my mind and, and put out in practice. To that point, I was go I like to do little role plays within the conversation. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're open to it, um, I, I was going to introduce the concept of a, a global project team. So imagine you and I are working in a global project team. It's a new team. It's just, just been formed. We're all relatively senior in our roles outside of the project team. And therefore, we're exposed to some local agendas and needs and expectations. And the project itself is quite ambitious. It's got a tight deadline, as like most, most projects. Um, and it's going to require quite a lot of operational change for a number of countries as we conclude this project. As a result, I'm sure you can imagine th there's going to be a lot of pushback. There's going to be a lot of potential challenges within right. the group dynamic. Based on your own experience and what you've seen, how would you go about getting the team to work effectively as quickly as possible? Get them all on the same page, perhaps. I would definitely set aside some time just to really get to know each other better and like to uh, like allow space for the team to really get to know each other not necessarily mm. just the experience or like the typical introductions but also in terms of how they prefer to communicate or what are their working hours if they are spread across or like really just to have this like basic expectations and and rules and and preferences out in the open Yep. So they would really know up front that, okay, like, let's say I have to do this and this and this if I have to work mm -hmm. with that other person so that I would know that, okay, that person prefers to, I don't know, set up a call two days in advance or just to kind of know the dynamics already a little bit. And then, of course, yeah. when, you know, they start working together, that's and there's always some hiccups on the way because that's mm -hmm. how it works. Yes. But it helps if we already have like a, a reference system. I do like to do this exercise called Fast Teaming Passport mm -hmm. um, with the teams, which is basically I just have a long questionnaire where, you know, everybody can put their preferences and then I, do, I can just put it together as like a right. team chart in a way that, that really contains all kinds of information about every team member. And then they can use this when they work together. And mm. then it also saves some time if, if there's no time to really do proper team building or really discuss these things in more in depth. Yeah. That can already be a strong starting point just to avoid like the initial typical misunderstandings. And, and I, I'm on board with you 100%. Um, I, my own experience is it takes multiple iterations mm -hmm. and trying to break down those barriers and, and trying to get... Um, <clears throat> a level of comfort even for many of the cultures to feel that they can speak. Yeah. Um, it, it, I, I often work with a lot of leaders who are expressing frustration and, and um, getting really agitated by certain members within their team, be, primarily because they don't understand their culture and the, the way that they approach Mm -hmm. people that they're not comfortable or familiar with right um <clears throat> so I, I i think it's a really interesting dynamic in the world that we live in today where there's so many cross-cultural global teams working on projects i i would love to see the statistics on how successful many of these teams are um I, I consider myself very worldly. <laughs> mm. I may not be, but I consider myself very worldly. <laughs> and yet, I we were talking before we came became live here today, we were talking, I, I was recently um, delivering a program around the world in, in, and I was in Spain for a while. And we had a number of European countries attending the training. And one of the topics, it was a leadership training, one of the topics was on psychological safety. Mm -hmm. I know you talk about this. And I won't go into the detail, but I was extremely surprised at how few people, and we're talking quite a large number, um, about 550 roundabout, mm -hmm. um, how few people really had heard even that term or knew anything about what it meant. Now, 
when I reflect back on that, and I've spoken with other people about it, the the feedback I've had is, you know, sometimes we get caught up in our own world and we, because we're exposed to it, we have an expectation others will automatically know. A little bit to your point earlier. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious what your experience is in that regard. Have you found yourself having to step back and, and pull back a little bit sometimes and, and check gosh, am I assuming too much here and, and do I need to take this from a different angle perhaps? Yeah, I think psychological safety is a great example because I think it's also a fairly new term in the sense mm. that it, it kind of became more known only a couple of years ago. Right. And I also find that it's it's something that kind of sounds scary at first. So I from all the conversations I'm having, mm -hmm. it's also either not very well known either or people already heard about it but they're just mm. like oh my god it sounds so serious or so deep or or they don't yeah. really know what it is yeah that that yeah I, and I work with this term a lot and one of one of the learnings I had especially through last year when I, I had a lot of conversations around this is that really like it's it's worth breaking it a little more down because it's not as mystical as it sounds but For because sure. it's <laughs> it sounds very mystical and people don't really know it or or mm. they just think that it's one thing but then yeah that's again making assumptions like it's it's really worth just kind of breaking it down into more simple terms and okay let's talk about then collaboration mm. or trust or you know just breaking it down into different elements and just approach yeah. those separately because then it also helps bringing this closer to people and then again also you know especially if you have a team which is very um, culturally diverse then of course also like the whole difference is that okay even if you say trust that doesn't mean the same thing to yeah, to one sure. culture to the other there yes. are all these value differences around hierarchy or how things should work so so there, there are just so many layers to it that that's why also I, I like to allow some space to really have these conversations because it just helps to have a strong yeah, starting point if you yeah. know if you already discussed yeah. these things I I find whenever I'm delivering these trainings, the, the side conversations that we have outside of the the classroom or the virtual setting always come back to these types of topics and yeah. trying to understand more about, gosh, this sounds really interesting. Where can I read more about it? What can I do to try and apply mm -hmm. this in my space at work type of thing? So I think there's a lot of interest around it when when people understand it as you say so it's, yeah very it's, much so especially yeah. if you really if, if it's a team who, are, who is going to work together and then you really break it down to actual action steps or actual tangible things they can do i think yes. that's when yeah. when it gets exciting for them because like okay this is actually something we can do something about yeah 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 very true and um i i would love to circle back in in 10 years time and just see for the groups that really apply this and take this on board, mm -hmm. what what is the network that they've established within that group? Like how how strong has it become over that period, and and has it become useful, or is it something that was disbanded after the project was finished? Type of thing. Of course, that's uh, crystal balling a little bit, but yeah, it would be very <laughs> interesting to go back and and challenge that whole concept. Absolutely. I touched on geopolitical challenges at the very beginning, and I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but is there anything you observe as a professional in intercultural um, observations? Is there anything you're seeing out there in the world at the moment where you, it's clearly not being helped, the, the situation, the geopolitical situation is not being helped let's say, by the um, lack of awareness around a different culture? Is, is mean, there anything I, that comes to mind? I, I think a lot of the conflicts we are seeing are really, at the bottom, are, are stemming from the lack of awareness and, and really all this polarity which is just also the lack of understanding or, or even just realizing that, that there are more sides to one truth. So there's no ultimate truth in every situation. It's just the perspectives. And, mm. 
And I find that this, or at least in my opinion, this is really just my personal opinion. Like I think what is really missing is be able to shift our mindsets to just see these different perspectives and not just stick to what we know and then keep sticking to that because that's not always the ultimate truth, I would say. Yeah, unfortunately, we live in a, a society, global society today where the media doesn't really help that that scenario, mm. right? It's um, yes. <clears throat> anyway, not not here to pick on the media, but, <laughs> but yeah, then... no, and and I think it's also because we we receive a lot of fractions of information, so it's also hard to know, like, okay, what is true, what is factual. Mm -hmm. So it's it's also because we are being constantly bombarded by by impulses and information and social media. Mm. It's it's also I think to some extent it's hard to distinguish, like, okay, what. Can I believe from all this? And and also yeah. I, I feel that it also there's like this general fatigue of information that is just yeah, like there's there's oh, just yeah. too much for everyone. There's just so much. Yeah. Yeah. What what do we believe? What don't we? What do we even want to read? Um yeah. you know. I, I have another scenario for you. This is back to <laughs> our conversation around um understanding self-awareness, but also understanding this this global cultural differences. Let, let's say that, and this is a two-part question, but let's say that we're mid-level, or I'm a mid-level corporate executive, and I, I want to advance my career, but unfortunately, locally, there's not many opportunities, right? And I only speak one language, and I've never worked abroad. And an opportunity happens to open up, but it means relocating overseas as an expat, what are some of the considerations that that I should be thinking about in the first instance? Oh, that's a big question because a lot depends on, on from where you're where you're relocating, obviously. Yes, yeah, very very true. Just um, to, just I, from a broad perspective, I would certainly like from a logistics point of view, like just you know to know more about how the country works in terms of you know paperwork or finding accommodation. Mm -hmm. Of course, it all depends on whether the company will take care of that part or not. But it's it's still something I usually recommend just discovering a little bit because well, we know every country works differently. The bureaucracy is painful everywhere, but it's differently painful. So yes. it's, you know, especially if you have a family to relocate, like you know, checking mm -hmm. the school systems or like there are a lot of information that you can gather about the country, mm -hmm. and I would certainly recommend that. Maybe even you know reading a little bit about the history because I think that also helps. Yeah. And and then of course if if there's a chance for you to get some some cultural training, I would always uh, recommend that because mm -hmm. yeah, just to understand like how like you know what culture is or how we function in cultures or just have like this this awareness that yes like what we are used to right now is not necessarily how things will work there and just be aware of those value differences that can occur behind um these these cultural differences like communication is just one thing but for example right. um you know like um uncertainty avoidance or you know like the concept around risk or or hierarchy and yes. whether the culture is more people focused mm -hmm. or task focused. So there, there's like so many different layers that I think definitely yeah. um, having having some kind of training around just knowing where these differences can exist mm. is, is already can be very helpful. Is there anywhere in particular that people can go and, and start to look at, like if, if let's say I'm in China at the moment, let's say I'm about to move to Germany, uh, this is a past experience, a personal, actual experience. Where would I be able to go and, and find out that type of information, regardless of which country? But is there any, like I just surfed the internet to try and find out that information, or is there any specific um, organisations that have this type of information? Um, I, I would say for, for this, I think social media can be very helpful because there are a lot mm. of groups, you know, with like expats who live in one country right. from another. So there are many, many groups where which are actually very helpful to get this kind of information. There are also relocation professionals who could also help with these kind of things. Um, yep. Also, I tend to recommend the book, like if, if you're new to the topic of, of cultural fluency, there is this book from Aaron Meyer called The Culture Map. 
which mm. I think is a very, very helpful first read because it's, it's very practical and it usually goes from the with corporate examples. So if, if you're moving for work, that's that's something very helpful to see how, how these differences manifest. Yeah. Um, of course, I, I also offer different services for people to help them prepare for, for these cultural differences. Um, yeah, you know, if anybody needs those, I'm, of course, also happy to help with this. Um, and yeah, it's also worth approaching embassies because sometimes they also mm -hmm. have like some kind of database or some information yeah. where they can just at least point into some direction to find this information. Yeah, I, I can imagine there's a huge source and you, you just reminded me, I need to ask, are you working on anything at the moment? Is there any new projects in the pipeline? Or are you thinking about writing a book yourself or what, what's happening for you? Um, I'm not really the writer type of person. I do write newsletters, though. I send two a month, and then I have some blog posts. So it's, you know, if, if someone wants to keep up with that, I, I'm always happy to have them in my world. Um, right. I, at currently, I, I offer uh, corporate programs uh, for teams, which mm -hmm. usually encompass this, like, cultural fluency, cognitive diversity, together with psychological safety and motivation. That's something that right. is always available. And then for individuals, at the moment, I offer... One-on-one um, -on -one packages, whether it's to work better with international colleagues uh, remotely or whether it's to move abroad, I have different packages for each because the approach is slightly different. Mm -hmm. And then in the autumn, I will probably launch a, a group course, a bootcamp style, just to understand cultural fluency better. So I always have a lot of things going on, so it's definitely worth keeping up with. With um... where where can people sort of follow and connect with you if they choose? So they can either find me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm mm -hmm. most active. Uh, it's yeah. also Cultural Origami, my business. It has also a LinkedIn page. Um, but also if, you know, you head over to, to culturalorigami.com, then there's there's all kinds of information there on, on everything and also the um, option to sign up to the newsletter. And then I also yeah. offer free consultation calls. So if anybody has any question or just unsure how to go about their cultural situation or needs I'm, I'm always happy to to jump on a call and just clear whatever questions they have up well we we'll definitely put all the links in the show notes but Chenga it's such a, a fascinating topic I, I I have my own view that I think for many leaders it's so overwhelming mm -hmm. that because of it they tend to steer clear of it and therefore yes. they don't develop and um, we see a lot of issues come out of out of it as a result. So definitely with the, the work that you're doing and, and other people in this space are doing, I think it's so important for the future of um, our global cooperation, if you like, it's, it's really important. So thank you for that. And, and thank you also for being a guest on the ET project. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, I absolutely agree. It, it can be a very overwhelming topic, but I think it's also because we can always break it down to smaller chunks and, and there's mm -hmm. always, like we don't just jump into the topic. There's always some kind of needs analysis before and some, so to say, diagnosis. Like, you know, it's, it's always yeah. step by step. And, and yeah, I think it's also important just to acknowledge that we can, we can take the overwhelm out of this and take it one step at a time. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much for having me, Wayne. No, my pleasure. Thank you. So what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button below and click on the bell icon so I can pop up in your feed occasionally with a great tip for your ultimate growth.